the instrument side of things never really came naturally. Okay. Um, but I was always into it, you know, like into concerts, into, you know, like as a sixth grader was like getting my parents, you know, dragging my parents to shows, you know, because I needed to go <laughs> and I couldn't, I had no other way to go, you know. Um, and so I quickly feel like I realized that I could do things with music or that there was opportunities to do things with music that wasn't being a musician, mm -hmm. you know? And so like in high school, um, we had uh, like a couple record labels in the high school, you know, where like groups of people would, uh, you know, take somebody's music that they found a way to record and we'd all like get together and duplicate cassettes together or, you know, make print up stuff to put in the packaging. And, and so we'd end up throwing all these basement shows and like our basement shows, like I still meet people like from all over St. Louis that were like, oh my God, you guys were those guys in, in Baldwin doing these, these basement shows. You know, we'd have 250 people at a house uh, for no real reason, you know. This is to where, you know, we even made a rule because uh, the way it works there is um, you have a, fo folks who are juniors and seniors take a class called engineering where they become the house engineers for the studios. Um, for the rest of the students, right? So if you're a freshman or a sophomore and coming in to do projects, you have a house engineer there while you do it. Hmm. And so we had this rule that said, there's no open time in the studio. Like if someone doesn't have it signed out, someone else is in there doing something, you know? And so that would lead to like 36 hour stretches of the same two people in the room just making shit up, just doing something new. Hmm. Um, and so it was this really neat sort of like accidental like collaboration, you know, almost endless possibility, like endless opportunity uh, type of situation. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could try shit. We could step out on a limb and do something weird because we had sort of the safety net to do it. Um, so it just sort of spawned this like, this mentality that said like, anything we want to do, just get some people together and let's do it. Let's mm -hmm. give it a shot. If it fails, Great, we learned something, we'll try it again, we'll, we'll mix it up. Sure. I had booked some shows before, um, mainly like school parties and stuff, you know, like way out club shows, just low key stuff, but that were real successful, which was the weird thing. Like hmm. everything always had a theme and it, and it got a lot of different groups of people to get, like it was just kind of my style. It's like, how would I play in a dinner party? Let's do it with bands and put in a, you know, a show and a lot of people would come just mm. because I was bringing four bands who might not play together together and it worked and people, people liked it. And mm. so I started to realize, well, maybe if I did that for, like I started booking shows, I could maybe raise a little money for the band and get us on show, you know, sort of set the shows up that I would want us to play yeah. and get us contacts out of town, you know. So I just kind of started booking them. You know, shows just kind of kept starting to come to me and I started meeting people out of town uh, mm -hmm. over the internet for that and um, and it was quickly like at least like every week in the RFT I had at least one critics pick because I was just picking the coolest bands I could get to come play shows here. I mean there are tons of people who like might pick one band that they end up setting up a show for in town right and they end up putting tons of work into it and it's low dividends, but that band had a good time, you mm -hmm. know. There are a number of people who sort of did what, do what I did at the time, mm -hmm. which it in, inadvertently creates this sort of pocket or this channel into, into St. Louis, right? Where, you know, you, you end up helping one band and then they tell another band from their region and that band contacts you and you help that band. And, and it just kind of sort, sorts of, like their networks spawn new inroads to your channel mm -hmm. into the town. Um, and so you build a lot of loyalty and a lot of people who just like want to keep doing shows with you, you know, because you treat them well. And it, if you don't watch out, it gets a life of its own. I mean, there was probably a time real early on where like I didn't have a club of my own, but I mean, I had 22 shows a month, which was way too much. <laughs> like way too, too way, 22 shows of bands who couldn't draw. So it was like, you know, having to build these shows up, having to like promote them, having to um, put great locals on them to get the people out, you know, and you do that for one band like three, four times, and then they're a band who can draw here, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, that was sort of what I learned from guys like Jimmy Bayback at the uh, 
Rocket Bar. And it was like, you know, Rocket Bar would like hammer the same band a few times, but you begin to kind of hear about them. You, you recognize the name, you know, and it was only for good bands, you know. And I sort of had to take, I took the stance that said like, I'm not going to book bands to book bands. Like I'm not going to, at the time I didn't have a reason to be open. I didn't have a club. I didn't have a necessity to have a show every night. So the whole idea was like curate the stuff like, sure. you know, and so it was cool because like uh, around that time too, like I met John Vogel, um, the poster artist and mm -hmm. like he didn't really like he liked making posters and lithographs and all this stuff, but he was right out of school and he didn't have connections to be making posters for all these shows. So I just blanketly on, I mean, I've probably done almost 200 shows with John. Um, and so, I mean, what was really neat was like, there was this sort of curation on the booking side. There was this sort of curation on the, the every show had a look, but they were consistent, mm -hmm. right? And so like people just started coming to shows because they saw one of those posters and they knew like that it, the, the, the quality that it was booked with. Right, sure. and that was sort of the, the Rocket Bar thing. It was like I would just go to Rocket Bar, knowing they had a show, not knowing who was playing, because it was worth it. It was you know worth seeing. I hated booking a show, like just a, it was just three bands, pay five dollars, come see the show. Yeah. I liked band, uh, shows having names, having themes, have even if they were made up, even if they were silly, even if they were worthless, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, Gentleman Auction House and Gentleman Callers playing the Battle of the Gentlemen. Mm -hmm, you know, sure. we had like a gentleman's cocktail on special, you know. It was just about doing something cool and kind of getting people together. And um, The next thing was this thing called the Indie Rock Ice Cream Social. Sure, I remember um, that. Which like did, the first two of them did over 350 people. And it was like, let, let, let's get ice cream and make it free. We'll just make Sundays for everybody. And let's have really cool bands. And so now we'll have people with a beer in one hand, ice cream Sunday in the other, all standing up against the stage. And and it worked. And it was really cool. And the the second one actually, you know, getting a local ice cream shop to come down with a <laughs> freezer and like to actually like that was one of the cool things that I realized is like people didn't expect anything, right? Right. But when they showed up and they had someone bending over backwards making them a you know like you would in an ice cream shop. Yeah. And then these awesome bands are playing. It was just sort of this weird, like your brain doesn't know how to process how cool this is. And it's mm -hmm. the same place I go to all the time, but for some reason tonight, it's totally different. Sure. And my $10 is, was worth a lot more tonight. And, and then we had um, an undercover weekend. Mm -hmm. And there was a thing in, um, in Champaign-Urbana called The Great Cover-Up. Okay. And I guess they still do it. Um, and so the premise was one night, um, you get like three or four of the best bands in town to pay tribute to another band for the night. Um, you don't know who they're going to be till they take the stage, right? Which is awesome. I mean, that's such a cool premise. Like you show up, you know, you're going to see something cool, but you don't know what it is mm -hmm. till like the first note, right? Well, we're too big of a town for that. Like we can't have that kind of a secret. So what we kind of decided to do was to take two nights five local bands a night, 30 minute sets, like short and sweet, and have them do this like sort of secret tribute set. And so we broke the secret the day before the RFT ran, like, you know, the, the leak, they leaked the secret the day before. Mm -hmm. And it was like, these bands were so excited about doing this that they literally worked harder than they've ever worked to get people to see it. And so, you know, you had like bands like Ghost and Light doing The Cure and like, there were, there were women weeping because it was so dead on. Mm. Like it was just so like such an homage to this thing. You had bands like Fatback as the Cars and from the very first note, you were just like, holy shit, these guys are like, are music fans. They're not just musicians. They're not just here pimping their own band. They're, they're fans of the same thing I am. Mm. And so like, you know, really part of the vision was to say, I want people to bond so much with these bands over what they cover for them to, for, for people in the audience to want to go see them immediately as themselves. I want them to like, to, to get the connection of why should I like these guys mm -hmm. by this night? And it was so cool because the first year, Annie from the RFT, the music editor came up to me and just said like, about Fatback being the car, she's like, I can't wait to see them be Fatback. I just can't wait. And so, you know, it was just this, 
remarkable thing. And from there, like, I only wanted to do it once. Like, I wanted my, my own band to play. We didn't even, we couldn't even pull it together. Hmm. So we didn't even get to play. And so, like, as soon as it was over, people were asking about the second one. Those kind of things were what kept me going in doing shows was because that brought out the best out of both parties, the fans and the bands, you mm -hmm. know? And, and it, it's cool, like, in, you know, now we've done five years of this. And uh, year four, like, uh, you know, talk about weird pairings, like, you had the Descendants right before Fleetwood Mac. Mm -hmm. And the people in the crowd sang the both. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what I so, sort of realized at this point was it, had, it hadn't really happened before in the show, but the whole thing I wanted where you would bond with the bands over who they covered, people were bonding with each other over, oh my God, you like The Descendants? And like, oh my God, you like Fleetwood Mac? Like, mm -hmm. it was just this really neat, like we all had the same roots. We're all, you know, you look different than me, but we're all the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and it's just, it's just been super cool to do. And so like at this point, I don't have a reason to book shows anymore. I don't have a band. I don't have a club. You know, I had that for a while. Um, but I do th this show <laughs> because it's special. It's something different. Sure. It's something really neat. Yeah. The really interesting thing that I think outsiders of those in the business, right? Of those yeah. who like run or own a club, who've ever booked shows before. And frankly, I feel like you've got to book a certain number of shows before a lot of this stuff becomes apparent. Mm -hmm. Having run a studio, having sold instruments, having, you know, what, what have you, been in a band, all these things. Yeah. But I think a lot of people who are passive about all that stuff, who just come to shows, who just like music, whatever, don't realize is that, like, these venues, these tours, these bands even, don't happen without cultivation. Right. True. And and like it's a chicken or the egg kind of scenario. Right. Um, you know, you look at a you look at a city like New York and people say like, oh, they're so lucky. They get all the tours. They get all the shows. They get whatever. Well, when you really think about it, like they're big enough of a city to have enough cool people who are willing to stick it out and willing to, to build new clubs, who are willing to like do daring things with venues, right? Mm -hmm. So that there are places for these bands to have these shows, sure. you know? That it's not just like they're in New York and so these things happen, that yeah. there was peop there was the chicken or the egg that sort of allowed it to happen, right? Yeah. And St. Louis, you know, um, I think one of the other driving forces was realizing that like we had sort of outlived the era that had Mississippi Nights, that had the Galaxy, that had the side door, that had the rocket bar, that had these places doing that for us. Those places all disappeared, right? And all of a sudden, it wasn't that bands were skipping us, they had nowhere to go, mm -hmm. right? They, like those bands had no contacts here, they had no venues to play here, they, had, they did not have the things that they needed to come play our city. It wasn't that our city was being overlooked, mm -hmm. our city wasn't providing. Sure. And so like, the double-edged sword with that is that we can provide the venue, we can provide the space, we can provide the ideation to, to, to go out and get those artists, right? Yeah. But we also have to create something that, t that, that the consumer wants enough to say, I'm going to take this little amount of discretionary spending that I have, and I'm gonna bookmark it for something like going to a show. Right, and so like that was a driving force for us, like doing the Bluebird and the Firebird, and even like just booking shows prior to that was that if we worked hard enough, and if we personally lost enough money, right, doing this over and over again, and kind of not relenting at failure, right, that it would work out. We couldn't have more than one or two sellout shows in a month, right? I mean, pageant excluded, right? Because like you have to think about too, like the way our city is separated. The pageant is in a place that people know about and that people are comfortable going to. Sure. Right? So, like, for instance, a really good example of that is my own band. Um, we were doing really well at a time. Like, we were hundreds of people would come to our shows. We'd play all different venues and have great success at all of them. We played Fair St. Louis in front of like 7,000 people. And my assumption, having sort of done this enough, was that you play in front of 7,000 people and if you have X, Y, and Z going for you, that's going to benefit your upcoming shows. It's going to help you sell albums. It's going to, you know, that, yeah. that's, that's logical, yeah. right? But we didn't have any change in our shows. It was the weirdest thing. It was like, 
did we, I mean, I didn't think we bombed. We had, we sold a lot of merch at the show. Like, I didn't really understand what had happened. Well, the following April, we played the pageant. We headlined a show at the pageant and did like over a thousand people. And like, for a local band, that was really good at the pageant. And it was remarkable to us because we hadn't been selling out some of the smaller places. And so it was like, okay, well, I wanted to know why this happened. So I asked anybody I could, like, what brought you here? Thank you for coming. What's up? Hmm. And a number of people, like a significant number of people were like, we saw you at Fair St. Louis. And we're so excited you're playing shows again. And I was like, wait, what do you mean? In, in the last almost a year, we've played 50 shows in St. Louis. We've, you know, whatever. What, what, what do you mean playing shows again? And I realized it was because there is like this radar issue, right? Like the go section of the post-dispatch doesn't cover anything lower than the pageant or Mississippi Nights at the time. Mm -hmm. So if we weren't playing there, we just weren't, nobody knew that like it was happening. Mm -hmm. Or if they knew it was happening, it was sort of in this like, oh, well, I'll never go off Broadway and Love. Why would I go there, right. you know? We sort of had to weather through shows that should have been selling out, shows that should have been doing above a certain number not. Like us losing money on a consistent basis in the hopes that the constant coverage we were getting, the constant like tour routings that were, that, you know, were showing up with St. Louis on the map, that that would train people to say, oh, wait a minute, like pay more attention, budget more money to go. And so, you know, over the years we started to see, okay, well, now it's not more, now it's not like two or three shows in the same month that sell out, it's two or three in the same week. And then it was like two on the same night. And now, you know, where we're at, I mean, you look at our mid -size, small and mid-sized venues and they're banging every night. Mm -hmm. You know, it's great. It's great to see people out all the time. And there's sort of this like misunderstanding about what it takes to get there. You know, it's, it's not this sort of like, are we cool or not in right. St. Louis? It's like, are there people who are willing to work that hard and to persevere to get that to happen? there's an atmosphere around these events, around these shows, around these clubs that says it's okay to go here. If that makes any sense. It's okay to take a chance. Mm -hmm. It's okay to come here on a Friday night. It's okay to go do something else and grab the la catch the last band at the show. And so it's not so much like, is anyone screaming louder or is anyone consuming more? It's more about sort of the consistency of the whole thing and the whole thing being like steady streams that are constant and consistent and people are willing to consume that, mm. you know, and they're willing to consume it in smaller chunks, more digestible chunks because it's less of an effort than it used to be. We're no longer a, a necessary point on the map. Like if you want to get to like Portland, like from Chicago, you don't go to St. Louis. You, you cut across Iowa, down through Denver, you know, and up, right? It's faster, it's cheaper, it's whatever, but you don't have as good a shows there, in my opinion, right? right. Um, so we've had to create, you know, like, we've, we've had to rebuild that again. Mm -hmm. And so March may be stock full of shows, but if it's not on the same wave as people spending money or people going to shows, or our local bands go in waves, right? Bands, right. bands hit a peak. And it seems like, you know, every other year bands all peak at the same time. We have a really high part of the scene and then stuff dies off. Those bands break up, they reform, same people. And again, it's the same churn of people, but it goes in waves. And so like those waves are not at the same point that people are going to shows and always, you sure. know, and so yeah, it's, it's so hard to predict, right. you know, and it's about being consistent. That's the, really the only way to level that, that wave out. Mm -hmm. Consistent um, in the, like the quality of just what you're producing. Sure. Yeah, consistent in quality, consistent in expectation, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I know like guys like Mike and Jimmy and them at the Firebird, like they've done a lot of work to sort of debunk the whole like, oh, well, it says 8.30, but it's not starting until 9.30, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it starts at this time, you know? Um, all these things, like being consistent about those change people's percept you know you can sort of guide people's behavior by consistency by mm -hmm. kind of leading by example when you have venues coming in and throwing a bunch of money at 
bands to get them to come to your venue, it screws up with this whole ecosystem, right? The ecosystem that said, these bands came to this venue because it was a better experience for them, or it was a better experience for the fans, mm -hmm. or they were treated the way that kind of band needed to be treated. Like, mm -hmm. th there's a reason why different shows happen at Firebird and, and off Broadway. Mm -hmm. They're they're just different atmospheres, right? Like, off Broadway's sound, stage setup, the just general club atmosphere doesn't work for very, various type of bands, you know, and vice versa. Yeah. And that's not to say either one is deficient, you know. Um, but those sort of niche things actually help with the consistency, right? You yeah. can sort of see what off-Broadway books and know what to expect there. And you're right if you walk in and see something different and, and feel weird about it. Mm -hmm. you're, you're right at that point.